Hi, I'm Dr. Jonathan Zelkin, CEO of Z Plastic Surgery and board certified plastic surgeon in Newport Beach, California. Today I'd like to talk about anular base resection. This is a standalone procedure in some cases, as the one presented in the video today, or it could be performed in conjunction with a formal rhinoplasty. In any case, the maneuvers are pretty easy, but it requires an artistic eye and a very delicate touch. I hope you enjoyed this video. So when I evaluate a patient who desires this procedure, I really look at the inside of her eyes as well as the outside of her nose. Ideally, the outside of the nose should be slightly beyond the inside of the eyes. And the idea is not to cut off the uh, width directly, but to rotate the nostril inward. Uh, performing the procedure awake is uh, very easy to do, but the, uh, the challenge and a lot of the time required for it does uh, come from making sure that the patient is perfectly comfortable. When I perform the operation, the patient receives about five to six cc's of uh, vasoconstrictor as well as 1% lidocaine. It's also uh, injected as a V2 infraorbital nerve block bilaterally uh, to really take a lot of the, uh, the direct regional block. Um, the patient really uh, should not feel a single thing during the procedure. The biggest complaint is that uh, he or she may be able to smell the electric cautery, uh, which I'll get into in a little bit. But again, uh, the, the procedure should be performed in under sterile conditions and OR conditions, whether or not it's performed in the OR or in the office. Um, obviously, this is a clean, contaminated case, but every effort should be made to keep this as sterile as possible. I use a betadine prep for this operation, and I also give the patient a pill that is compounded for my practice that includes Valium, Percocet, and Zofran. And all of these help with uh, nausea, vomiting, as well as pain control and anxiety. Once the patient is uh, comfortable and relaxed, it really should be like a spa environment for the patient. Even though there's going to be some pressure that she feels, uh, possibly some sense that she smells and some sounds that she hears, the procedure should be very well tolerated. If the patient's uncomfortable whatsoever, stop, apply more vasoconstrictor, and then resume after the vasoconstrictor and the numbing medication have time to take effect. I also should make it very clear that the patient should be marked uh, prior to infiltration of the uh, tumescent uh, uh, anesthetic agent as well as the vasoconstrictor because it can certainly distort the markings. I like to keep the, uh, the ALAR wedge uh, marking approximately uh, half a millimeter uh, anterior to the uh, ALAR crease. Some people say a millimeter, uh, somewhere in between there is good. Um, again, you, you know, no marking pen is really good enough to discern between half a millimeter and a millimeter, so a lot of it has to do with uh, visible landmarks and making sure that uh, you have achieved symmetry uh, one side to the other. The important thing is that you leave a remnant behind of the uh, existing anatomic alar crease to ensure that the patient has um, uh, a natural uh, result without any issues uh, as far as visible scarring. Um, I also, as you see, include a nostril sill excision uh, as part of my ALAR wedge. A lot of times you have to quick, uh, carefully evaluate whether or not the patient has an excess in flare alone or in width. If the patient has an excess in flare and width, as this patient did, then a wedge excision as well as the nostril sill excision is necessary. I placed the piece back in to show you that this is not truly a wedge, but it has two dimensions. It has a vertical component in the nostril sill that reduces the width of the nose, as well as a uh, horizontal component or a vertical component on the, uh, the nasal ala, which is really better for the alar flaring. Um, as you see here, some people talk about avoidance of uh, using monopolar electric cautery. I absolutely think it's fine to do, but I use a needle tip and I use 15-15 cutting and coagulation current. Uh, and I do make every effort I possibly can to make sure that the wound is absolutely dry. However, I do stay uh, clear of the dermal edges as in this Latina patient, there is a propensity for hyperpigmented scarring. And again, my objective is to create an, un, as, uh, an, an as natural and um, and invisible of a scar as possible. Again, placement of the scars in, in very uh, strategic positions is important, but uh, it's also important to make sure that the patient has achieved uh, excellent hemostasis throughout the procedure. I continue with a series of uh, transdermal stitches. Uh, I do largely follow the technique uh, as described by Crydell, but uh, I also believe in uh, Rod Rorick's theory that uh, avoidance of deep stitches does avoid spitting sutures in the long term. I've seen in the past that when I place deep stitches, it does let me sleep better at night that I have an extra layer of protection and tension offloading, but it does uh, have a tendency, especially in the sebaceous tissue, to lead to, uh, to small uh, spitting stitches. So to avoid that, I uh, do a, a ton 
of uh, small transdermal sutures. What I use here is a, a proline, uh, 6-0 proline suture, and I do bisect it every time. So I perform the first stitch in the nostril sill to make sure that I have perfect anatomic alignment of the fragments. That's the most important stitch that I can place. And then I bisect the difference between the, uh, the, the cephalad most incision uh, in the sill, and I keep going back and forth until I have enough sutures that the wound is entirely closed without any gapping whatsoever. And again, I'm showing you uh, the technique that I use. I really make every effort not to pinch the skin with the uh, Adson uh, forceps, uh, and I try to make everything as, uh, as gentle on the skin as possible. I do see dermal oozing throughout the procedure, and I'm perfectly uh, fine with that. Um, and again, uh, when I do grasp the skin, it's very, very delicate. This skin, as we all know, is very friable, and it doesn't tolerate much for tension as well as trauma. Um, in order to make this scar, especially in a Latina patient, as invisible as possible, I try to use the most atraumatic technique as po uh, is, is possible, uh, and that includes uh, conservative electric cautery of the bleeding. Um, you also may have noticed when I was excising that skin wedge that I was being very careful because uh, just lateral to the lateral ala, there is, a, uh, tra uh, there is an angular vessel that when it bleeds will require a lot of electric pottery to control it. So I prefer to visualize that, uh, that vessel, which I always see, um, or not visualize it and just steer clear of it. But uh, when you break through it, that does require a lot of electric pottery, which is going to in turn create trauma and a uh, theoretically worse scar. Since I don't use deep sutures, I place a, uh, a very liberal amount of uh, 6 proline stitches uh, through the incision to share the tension throughout. Um, this is a very strong repair, um, and the patient does not have strong lower lateral cartilages, so it doesn't have any tension on the repair anyway. Um, if the patient did have a lot of tension, I would probably err on the side of placing a deep stitch or two uh, to offload that tension, or a placement of an alar cinched suture, which I've, uh, which I've shown in a, another video on this channel. And again, um, I'm going to show you every single stitch I place, at least on this side, just to show you that uh, two or three stitches is not enough. If you really want an invisible scar, place as many stitches as you can to make sure that the wounds are perfectly uh, co-opted uh, throughout the entire uh, ALAR wedge. I don't have an assistant in this procedure. If I had an assistant, it would be a lot easier, um, but uh, it is certainly not necessary. Other people ask about the use of chromic sutures inside the nostril. Um, I will go back after this video and I will place uh, 5 0 fast absorbing gut sutures uh, in the mucosal portion of the uh, closure. However, for the sake of the video, you're going to see the uh, cutaneous uh, proline closure. I place betadine on top of the wound when I'm done uh, and I make sure it's very clean. I do complete one side before starting on the other side. This not only shows you a nice before and after on the table, but it gives you a landmark at which you can, uh, you can model the uh, contralateral side. I'm right-handed, so I stay on the patient's right side and I perform her left uh, resection first, then I go to the right side uh, second. And I'm constantly looking back and forth and making sure I've achieved symmetry. After placement of tumescent, sometimes uh, you, can't, you can't ensure that you have perfect symmetry because there is going to be a tumescent effect, um, but uh, you can get pretty close. And that's why, again, the markings are so critical to make prior to, uh, uh, prior to tumescing with uh, the lidocaine with epinephrine. The other thing I did on this patient was notice that she had a slight asymmetry with a nostril uh, base length. However, the, uh, the lower alar length was uh, about the same on both sides. So I took off a very um, uh, liberal seven millimeters of tissue on each side. Um, and the apex of this really is at the, uh, the lateral most aspect of the uh, lower lateral cartilage in the ala. I'm taking a full thickness wedge resection of this tissue, making sure not to um, cut any of the surrounding tissue and to uh, avoid any collateral damage as possible. I do change the angle of the uh, 15 blade when I get inside the nostril cell for that vertical component. And you can see here again as I take it out that this is not truly a wedge, but there are two dimensions to it and it's more of a chevron. Um, you can see here that uh, prior to cauterization there's some oozing and I really do want to be uh, quite liberal with the cautery here but at the same time I want to steer clear of the dermal edge if possible. I'm willing to tolerate a little bit of dermal edge bleeding uh, for the sake of not providing any, uh, any additional trauma to that tissue. Uh, this is a again um, a needle point tip with uh, 1515 on the coagulation and cautery 
and cutting current settings. The patient sometimes will complain about the smell. You certainly, as the surgeon, will smell this as well, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not a smell that's intolerable to the patient or to you. If there is an intolerance to it, you can, uh, of course, add suction to this uh, and use a smoke evacuator. Again, patients don't uh, complain, but you do have to keep in mind that they should be aware of what that smell is because it can startle some. Again, really take your time with the electropottery, but uh, avoid dermal edges as possible. You also see that instead of using an Addison Brown forcep, I'm going to use my finger and a Raytex sponge uh, as much as possible to grip the lower lateral tissue because even odd atraumatic uh, forceps can cause um, injury to the dermal edges and that's certainly what I want to avoid. I can't promise that I'm going to create an invisible scar, but I certainly can do my best to avoid um, maneuvers that uh, will increase the tendency for a hyperemic or hyperpigmented scar in this Fitzpatrick 4 patient with, uh, with sebaceous tissue. I'm going to fast forward through the remainder of the closure, but again, it's really important that you understand that we uh, bisect. You can see that I placed the ALAR or the nostril seal uh, closure first, which is the key uh, of, the, of the closure, and I really take an eye and make sure that I've created a symmetric result. Uh, then I bisect the difference between that suture and the cephalic edge, and then I continue to bisect, continue to bisect, continue to bisect. Um, I didn't count in this video, but I probably place about 10 stitches per side. Um, even though this may seem excessive, again, I do try to avoid the use of deep stitches uh, for the sake of preventing um, additional inflammation, uh, spitting stitches, and uh, the possibility of a suture abscess in this uh, sebaceous tissue. Um, I'm very delicate about these stitches. Uh, again, since the tissue is friable, if you put too much tension on them, they can rip out easily. So place a lot of stitches, tell the patient to be very gentle, and then very carefully evaluate your results. Here I've achieved a very symmetric result, bringing the ALAR edges just medial to the uh, medial canthi, which is ideal um, according to uh, canons of plastic surgery. This really is going to enhance her facial appearance and it's going to project her under projected nose somewhere. Thank you so much for your time.